Hello, uh, my name is Faith Norris, and I'm a junior at Drake University. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm here tonight to share about the way God has saved me and changed my life. But first, I'd like to pray, if you would pray with me. Um, yeah, Heavenly Father, um, we just praise you for who you are, God, um, for your goodness um, and for your grace, God, um, to save um, to save a sinner like me. Um, yeah, God, I just pray that you would be um, exalted, that I would be humbled tonight. God, I pray that you would calm my nerves. Um, and yeah, that you would be seen, that this is not my story, but it's yours. Um, yeah, that you would be lifted up and um, receive all of the glory and all the praise um, tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, I was raised in a home by two parents who loved God and deeply desired me to know him. I grew up in a pretty big family, being number five of six kids. From a very young age, I was ruled by my desire for attention. We went to a small church where I attended church every Sunday, Awana and youth group on Wednesday nights and Sunday school on Sunday mornings. When I was four, I asked Jesus into my heart in Awana Cubbies. I actually don't remember this moment, but for the next 14 years of my life, I would have said this was when I became a Christian. I never had assurance in my salvation. I would rededicate my life to Christ almost every summer at camp, hoping this time it would work and I would feel like a Christian. I was searching for some emotional moment when things would finally click. As a kid, I loved my reputation as the good Christian kid. My ply blinded, blinded me to my sin. I knew I was a sinner, but I didn't think my sin was significant enough to need saving. I remember sitting in church or youth group and thinking about all the other people I thought needed to hear the message, ignorant to the sin in my life and in my heart. I cared a lot about what other people thought about me. I think some of this manifested as a result of being the fifth child, craving any attention or praise my older siblings would give me. This was also true in friendships, as I was obsessed with being popular and known, and a desire for relationships consumed me. When I was a junior in high school, I was in my first relationship, and I was ecstatic. Although I totally thought this relationship would fulfill me, I was left pretty empty. My worth was tied into what he said was true about me. There was so much physical and emotional sin, but I justified it whatever way possible and pushed down the shame and guilt that I felt. I knew it was sin, but I wasn't willing to give it up. A few months later, we broke up, and I completely blamed him, along with convincing all of his friends to no longer be friends with him, justifying my sin because I felt like he deserved it. I was incredibly selfish and prideful, consumed by the opinions and intention of others. I was lustful and jealous, ruled by comparison that often led to gossip and slander. Looking back, I can see that I desperately desired to be seen, known, and loved. My senior year of high school, I made the decision to come to Drake. Abby Newman was my roommate, and right away I got connected with Campus Fellowship, mainly to maintain my Christian reputation and because I wanted friends, and I pretty much just went everywhere Abby did. I started reading the Bible with older women who shared the gospel with me in a way I had never heard it before. Jesus' death on the cross seemed to pertain specifically to me, but I'm not really sure I understood why that would be necessary. I saw something different in the lives of the people I was meeting. Christ was their whole life, not just something to check off a list. Through hearing testimonies at midweek, I saw that people had a deep understanding of their sin and need for a savior. I knew that my life didn't look the same. I saw a community of people who deeply loved God, and because of that, deeply loved one another. It was un unlike anything I'd ever seen. I wanted to know God like they did and love those around me in response. I was meeting with Kate Wellens when I began I, to realize I wasn't sure if I was a Christian. I began praying that God would give me a desire to know him and to love him, and he would help me to understand the weight of my sin and my need for grace. In Bible study that year, we read Matthew 5, conveniently what we've been going through at midweek this semester. I remember reading about how Jesus equates the judgment due, to mur or due for murder to that, to being angry with a friend, and that even looking at someone lustfully equates to adultery in the heart. By the grace of God, I began to see the reality of my sin against a perfectly holy God. My sinful pride had blinded me to my external and internal sin, and in my sin, I'm unable to be in his presence. God showed me the overwhelming reality of his grace displayed through Christ's work on the cross. I am deserving of eternal separation from him, but through Christ's work, I can joyfully stand in his presence. In Christ, I am fully known, and I am fully loved, and I am able to walk with God, with Christ as my mediator and advocate. I am sinful, but God is gracious to pass over judgment because of Christ's blood. Christ lived perfectly when I couldn't and died the death I was deserving of. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The reality of my sin hasn't changed, but my standing before God has. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I used to crave self-worship, and now I crave to worship God. I still fall into sin every single day, but my salvation is secure in Christ. 
Recently, I've been believing a lie that if I'm unfaithful to him, the Lord will withhold good from me. If I could just be more faithful, then things would be better. This is first sin in thinking that the plans I have are what's best and also just not true. If this were true, I wouldn't be serving a good God. But God is good and his will is what's best for us and it brings his son the most glory. Becoming a Christian means my life is no longer mine. I am now under the authority of Christ. With that also means asking the question, do I really believe what he has is best and do I really trust him with my whole life? This means going wherever he calls and trusting that he is good and worthy of my life. This means keeping my eyes fixed on the hope of salvation, pursuing holiness until Christ returns. I'm sure that there are many of you here tonight who, like me, grew up in a Christian home and have always just assumed you're a Christian. I urge you to see the reality of the gospel and therefore the urgency of it. God fully knows you and wants a relationship with you. I plead with you that you reflect on the state of your soul, reject sin, and turn to Christ. There's nowhere else you'll ever find true satisfaction, true peace, true joy, true fulfillment, true rest lies in Christ alone. Um, If you have any questions or just want to chat, I love to chat with you after. Thank you.